Hi, welcome back to the Strategy YouTube channel. This video is the 100 subscriber special where I go over all of the decks I personally own in paper. I decided to limit the scope of the video because it, I already know this video is going to go on for a while. I have 10 decks that I personally own in paper, and even if I limit myself to like two or three minutes per deck, this is already looking like it's going to be a 30 minute long video. So if you're curious about the decks that I have on my computer and I play online only, stay tuned. I'll probably make deck techs about them as time goes on just like the Cooligan video and for decks that are partly built or I started them but never finished that'll probably be another video in the future too I've decided to order this list chronologically with the oldest deck coming first and then the most recent deck at the end each of these decks has a link to a complete deck list in the description below and I also think it'll be fun to look at each decks individual salt score according to Archideck and that way you'll know if you want to give this deck a try how salty it's gonna make other people at the table and at the the end of this video I've ranked the decks based on their salt score what I think their power level is and how complicated I think they are to play that way you can see how these decks stack up against each other so you won't want to miss it that being said let's get started the first and technically oldest complete commander deck I've owned is my Duretti scrap savant deck I was interested in commander for a couple years before this but I was way too broke to get involved in the format as a gift I got both the forged in stone and the built from scratch pre-constructed commander 2013 decks so this was a wonderful gift for my family if i remember right the forged in stone deck kind of got scrapped and then all the good artifacts were put into this deck anyway so that's why forged in stone is not on our list this deck was pretty easy to understand it's artifacts good stuff i found rare and mythic artifacts that i thought were cool and started stuffing them in the deck and it worked pretty well duretti's a pretty consistent commander to utilize he's not too complicated and he gets down to business right away but looking back on this deck i can tell that i was new newer to the format. I, it's pretty plain for me to see. I have a Blood Moon in here, which didn't have any synergy except that I'm playing Mono Red anyway, so I figured it doesn't hurt me, but it hurts everybody else. I also have a Flamekin Village and Memorial to War for lands in this deck. I think they were either in the pre-constructed deck or I put them in later because I thought they were really cool utility lands. That's kind of the perks of having a mono-colored deck. You can go crazy with the lands and probably still be alright. This deck's salt score is coming in at 34.49, and I pretty Pretty sure I can point the finger at Blood Moon, Mind Slaver, and Dark Steel Forge. Yeah, early on I put a lot of money into my decks. This also marks the beginning of a trend I noticed with my old decks, where the mindset was I want to win, and to win I need to be the strongest, and to be the strongest I need the strongest, most powerful, and expensive cards. That was my goal. Let me know in the comments if you have or currently are going through that phase too. I feel like a lot of new players in Commander go through that. My next oldest deck on the list, missing out on old oldest by merely a couple hours is my Teferi Temporal Archmage deck. The backstory here was that after I was gifted those two decks, I reached out to my friends and they let me know they already had those decks. My friend with the white deck let me know it was already considered the best of the five based on reprint value alone, and that there were tons of stories about people going to their local gaming store, buying the deck, and then selling part of it back to the game store for more money than they had spent on the deck. And then my other friend who had the red deck let me know that it was the best of the five when looking at strength of the deck alone and not considering financial reasons. We had a player on the green deck, we had a player on the black deck, and in fact the consensus in our group was that all of the decks were playable and strong except for the blue one. Everybody was telling me that the blue peer through time deck with Teferi at the helm was the worst one. It was a total joke. They said it was gimmicky relying on mechanics like morph and tapping down other players creatures and that Teferi himself was way too slow of a commander. Having a mana value of 6 meant that by the time Teferi was on the board, everybody else's Planeswalker commanders would have had multiple turns of playing the game. And he doesn't even have a plus 2, he had a plus 1 instead. So nobody in the group had bought the blue deck. And this is where the start of another pattern comes into play. I'm a bit of a contrarian, and I love a good underdog. So instead of being the second Duretti player or second Nahiri player, I went right to target and bought the blue deck. There was a minute where I was questioning if this was the road I wanted to go down. There were so many people arguing that Teferi and his deck sucked. But I thought he deserved a chance at the table, and I thought his minus one was a really cool and unique ability. As soon as I cracked open the deck when I got home and I saw cards like Pongify, I was sold. And Teferi was my number one favorite deck for years after that, knocking Duretti out of the limelight and making him the neglected child of the commander decks. And that's how the dynamic was between them for years after that. Duretti was only there, so if I had to play a game against myself, I would play Teferi and Duretti. Or Duretti was the deck I pulled out if people were sick of my Teferi shenanigans. 
shenanigans. And shenanigans was a good way to describe the deck in its early stages. I didn't necessarily have a win con outside of combat damage, so I was just manipulating the board and countering people's spells, playing cool morph creatures, making them guess. But even in doing that, I saw the value in Teferi. His minus one was incredibly good. If I have a Thran Dynamo and a Soul Ring out, then the turn I play him, I can minus one and untap two islands, the Soul Ring and the Thran Dynamo, and I'll have net gained mana for the turn. Not to mention the plus one, which gave card draw. But what really fascinated me was his minus 10 ability. When I realized that emblem allowed my Planeswalkers to activate multiple times in a turn cycle, it changed the whole direction of the deck. Part of the reason I was so interested in Commander 2014 in the first place was because I thought Planeswalkers were really cool, and I loved the idea of having one in the command zone. So that turned into a pretty clear direction for deck building moving forward. I wanted to do mono blue super friends just to see if it could be done. Part of the reason I loved Pongify in the first place is because mono blue isn't usually known for the creature destruction spells. So when I was sat down at the table, nobody ever saw the blue removal coming. I really loved the idea of finding all of these blue cards that kind of break the color identity and putting them in one deck. I wanted to prove that a mono blue deck could do the things that other colors famously exclusively claim to do. I wanted ramp, I wanted healing, I wanted creature removal, I wanted board wipes. But when somebody in our playgroup pulled a copy of the chain veil, that changed everything for this deck. And as soon as I bought a copy, it put this deck into overdrive. The current state of the deck kept its super friends roots, but moved heavily into stacks. Teferi plus winter orb or Teferi plus stasis is a really potent and deadly combo, and once I have infinite mana and infinite planeswalker activations with Teferi, I can do a bunch of wacky stuff with all kinds of planeswalkers. Tezzeret the Seeker is a planeswalker who can tutor out the chain veil for me. And Jace, Cunning Castaway, can make infinite copies of himself while also making infinite 2-2 illusion tokens. The deck also relies on a lot of cantrips and delve spells, which is cool in theory with Elixir of Immortality because I can get rid of all of those cantrips using the delve spells and shuffle only the good cards back into my deck, but the price I pay is an empty hand more often than not. Like I said, I exclusively played this deck for years, and I only stopped playing it because this deck got too strong and I was getting bored of winning all the time. Not to mention it made a lot of people feel stupid stuck and they didn't want to play against it anymore. And if we look at the salt score, you can see why. This deck is clocking in at a 59.56, almost double the score of my Doretti deck. And there's no beating around the bush with this. Winter Orb and Stasis are the number one and number two saltiest cards on the entire list. This deck represents the peak of my I want to win, I want to have the best cards, I want to have the most expensive cards phase in Magic. And for about half my time playing Magic and most of my time playing Commander, this was my one deck. And I I won all the time, but winning all the time didn't make me want to keep playing the game. And in those years, I fell in and out of magic until I rediscovered a legendary creature I'd been wanting to build a deck around since the very beginning of my time playing magic when I pulled it out of one of my first packs, which leads us into deck number three, my Kazool Tyrant of the Cliffs deck. This is another monocolored deck, and you'll notice that's a trend of mine. I prefer to have one or two colors only in my commander decks. I guess it just makes things easier, and also, like my Teferi deck, I want to push the boundaries of the color pie that I'm in and really find those unique janky cards that push the mold and I feel like just splashing two or three other colors is kind of the lazy way of doing things plus the mana base is a lot cheaper and a lot more consistent I can rely on a lot of colorless mana and I can play a bunch of cool utility lands which I really enjoy in magic for some reason and if you're curious yes I did start magic around the time of the Zendikar block I don't think I actually bought any Zendikar packs my first purchase into magic was something called the deck builders toolkit I don't think they do this anymore but I could be wrong but when I got excited to try magic I bought this box it was like 40 bucks and they give you a bunch of commons and uncommons from the most recent sets and they came with a couple packs hard to believe that was way back in 2010 I still have that box somewhere too it still has my name written on it in sharpie because there were other people I was playing with at the time who had the same box as me so I wrote my name in sharpie on the box it's all beat up it's what I carried my deck in whenever I'd go hang out with people and play magic it was a pretty cool box but anyway this deck was was envisioned as sort of a mono red pillow fort deck but quickly became a goading sort of deck with the idea being we put Kazul down and we make everybody's creatures attack and if they don't want to pay the three we can just block with the ogre and the hope is that they kill each other and then we kill the last person the majority of this deck was put together at my house with the cards I had in my collection I would I would guess probably about 20% of the cards in the deck I actually bought for this deck which is good that's what I wanted I wanted like a deck that was sort of a foil to my Teferi 
deck. I wanted a deck that I could pull out at a casual table and not make people feel terrible or just steamroll the game. A deck where I could just kind of vibe out and let people play. And Kazul does that pretty well. There are some interesting synergies in this deck, like um, like Dragon Throne of Tarkir is cool with Kazul because if you give him Defender and then you goad all the creatures on the battlefield, he can't swing anyway, so it doesn't matter. Plus, if you're making a lot of tokens with Kazul, you don't need to use them to block the creatures. That's an option you have, but you can also let yourself amass ogres. And then I can use the Dragon Throne with Kazul to give them all plus five, plus five, and then swing out for like an overrun style effect, which is pretty cool. I got to play around with some Monarch cards, which was kind of new back then. Overall, the deck did exactly what I wanted it to do. Even for the lands in the deck, I went through my deck boxes and found all of the old 2011-2012 mountains, the ones that were especially worn out from play. And like my two previous decks, I don't usually update this deck or buy new cards for it, because I specifically don't want it to be too strong. Yeah, this deck was definitely a step away from that phase we talked about before, where I wanted to win no matter what, and that's how I had fun. Kazul was me testing to see if I could enjoy the game without having to win. And I found that what I like most about magic isn't winning, but it's messing with people. I like to puzzle them or put them in weird situations that they have to figure out a solution to. It's almost like the card game Flux if you've ever played it, where you kind of add new rules as the game goes on and the players have to maneuver around all of these rules overlapping each other, and that's kind of the fun of it. And yeah, this deck does that pretty well. The deck has a salt score of 29.23, which I felt was surprisingly high considering what it was made up of, so I figured there must have been one or two two cards that people felt very salty about that were pushing that score up. But according to Architect, the saltiest card in the deck is the Soul Ring. So I guess cards in the Goad theme in general come with an inherent a little bit of salt because some people are really bothered by that. But overall, this is the lowest salt score so far. Next up on my list is my Nyambi Faithful Healer deck. And the story behind this deck is I built it out of a fear I had that people would get annoyed that all of my commanders were planeswalkers. And so they would threaten to leave me out of the group if I didn't find a legendary creature to put in the command zone. I don't know if there was any real threat of this happening or if it was all in my head. I think the worst that came about it was I had one friend who on a couple occasions complained that I always played planeswalkers in the command zone and that real commander involved creatures in the command zone. So my Nyambi Faithful Healer deck is a creature in the command zone but the whole point is that I can cast her and then fetch up a Teferi from my deck and have a Teferi to play with just like I had in my mono blue Teferi deck. There's not really much else to say about it. This is my first multicolor deck on the list. I saw this deck as the counter to my Kazool deck, just like my Teferi deck and my Duretti deck were sort of counters to each other. For some reason, blue and red often clashed in a really cool way to me. But yeah, Nyambi has a couple cool combos. I have a lands combo revolving around Magosi the Water Veil, where if I take a turn and then skip a turn, I can have infinite turns. And this deck didn't get nearly the financial aid that my actual main Teferi deck did. This was just just a fun little backup if my main Teferi deck was way too powerful, or if people were complaining way too much. It was kind of a joke more than anything. Its salt score is coming up at 44.27, which is pretty high, but not nearly as high as the other Teferi deck. I would consider this salt score to be on the very edge of what I would be comfortable playing. So she's not too far over, but you know, it's still a little annoying. The next deck on our list was under construction at the same time I was building my Kazool deck and finished up not long long after that one, and it represents my one and only attempt at making a CEDH deck. This was my Hisoka Minamu Sensei budget mono blue stacks deck. I say budget lightly because the budget was very real. It wasn't a fun gimmick I was trying to put on. I really truly had not enough money to build the deck like I wanted it to, but I tried. I tried to make something unique at the same time. I didn't want to copy what everybody else was doing. And so I was browsing EDH rec for really underplayed commanders and I saw Hisoka. And I thought this ability wasn't that bad. I think the reason people didn't play it is because everyone will hate you if you bring this to the table. But in CDH, that doesn't matter anyway, because people are expecting that. If my Kazool deck was the manifestation of me taking a step away from wanting to be competitive and winning all the time, my Hisoka deck was the opposite. It was me deciding that my mono blue stacks to fairy deck wasn't competitive enough, and it was time to go all in. The game plan of this deck was to get Hisoka down as soon as possible, and to use stacks pieces like Arcane Laboratory and Counterbalance to limit my opponent's spellcasting as 
as much as possible. In theory, the most popular mana values used in CEDH is 0, 1, 2, and maybe 3. So as long as I shape my deck to have a lot of cards with those mana values, I'd pretty much always have fuel to counter people's spells as long as I had cards in hand. I could even pitch lands to counter things with 0 mana value. And then to win, all I had to do is generate infinite colorless mana and use a card like Blue Sun Zenith to make an opponent mill their entire deck and lose the game. Alternatively, I'm also running a copy of Mask of the Mimic. So if my opponent was going to win using Thassa's Oracle, I can swoop in using Mask of the Mimic to sacrifice my own commander and search out my own Thassa's Oracle. And with that ETB ability on the stack, I could use my infinite colorless mana to draw through my entire deck using a card like Prophet of Distortion, winning the game for me. I should also mention that this idea of using Mask of the Mimic in CEDH to try to steal the win from somebody is not an original idea of mine. I took this idea from Demo, the YouTuber who runs the channel EDH Deck Building. I think I must have built this deck around 2018, so that was probably about when I started watching his channel to get ideas, and I borrow more than one idea from him for my decks, I mean he's got a lot of really good ideas. So to save time, whenever I reference an idea or a specific strategy that I borrowed from Demo, I'm gonna flash his YouTube logo in the top right. And if you somehow have found my channel but you've never heard of his channel, you really should check it out. His content was by far the biggest inspiration for this entire channel. And he did a shout out to my channel in one of his recent videos about a Derevi deck that doesn't cast any spells, which took some inspiration from a deck that's coming up on this list. So we're basically best friends now, and here's a picture to prove it. Unfortunately for this deck, it never got to see the light of day. It's fully complete, and it's in a box in my room, but I've never used it. The big issue, like I said, was getting the money together to buy the cards that I wanted. I didn't want to proxy cards for some reason. I had a distaste to that. Looking back, I wish I had done that now. I spent probably over a hundred dollars just buying mana rocks for this deck and they're sitting there not seeing play and not being used. But what really broke my spirit with this deck and for trying CEDH was when Jeweled Lotus was printed. I had just spent so much money on Mana Vault and Mana Lith or whatever the other one is. And when Jeweled Lotus came out, I was just done. I was sick of Magic's keeping up with the Joneses problem. And I realized in that moment that they were just going to always keep printing more staples that I would need to buy to keep this deck competitive. And when my Hisoka deck finally pitifully died, my phase of trying to have the best strongest deck died with it. And I've never had that desire again. This deck has a salt score of 71, which doesn't surprise me at all. This deck is basically my Teferi deck if it was given a blank check, doubled down on stacks, and decided it would win the game at all costs. This deck is unethical. Please do not bring it to a casual table. It won't even be good. Mask of the Mimic is probably going to do nothing. And if players are playing any cards over CMC3, you're likely not going to be able to counter it anyway. Just don't do it. Funny enough, this next deck swings in the complete opposite direction. This is my Jared Carthelian 25 cent box deck. The gimmick of this deck was I spent five hours in my local game store one day just digging through their 25 cent rares box with the self-imposed goal of making an entire commander deck with only cards that the store considered to be worth 25 cents or less. Looking back on the history of these decks is making me seriously wonder if this Jared deck was a budget deck because the Hisoka deck was so scarringly expensive. The next deck after this one also had a budget in mind. And the deck after that one. Yeah, I actually think that that's probably why. Subconsciously I was still reeling from the fact that I spent $100 on a deck that's in a box I never use. In a way, it's like Hisoka's deck was so expensive that he reached into the future and started siphoning off funds for my future decks. Typical. This deck was three color out of necessity. I just didn't have the time or the background knowledge to know what commons from what sets could be used in a mono color or two color deck to get the same result as a three or four color deck. If I wanted a deck that was consistently value, I'd need to pull from multiple directions. And the commander I eventually arrived on was Jared Carthelian, True Air. Having to regain Monarch every time he enters the battlefield is pretty annoying, but I found a lot of ways that I could put a ton of damage on Jared. Otherwise, it's sort of a good stuff deck with a sub theme of tokens and another sub theme of thrones. I know that sounds random, but to me it was a flavor win. Jared is the true heir, a rightful claimant to the throne who's been ousted, and he's on a mission to get that throne back. To that end, if he has the opportunity while on his journey to use his heritage to claim the throne of other kingdoms, I say that's his right. So I've included the throne of empires as well as the crown and the scepter in this deck, and I also threw in the dragon throne of Tarkir. So even if Jared can't be the monarch he wants to be, he can at least sit on a couple thrones, making tokens and buffing the team. Cards like World Queller and Guild Feud are just in this deck for value. They don't really fit any theme at all. And this deck's salt score is a respectably low 
0.55, just the right spot of where I like to be. The kind of low that's likely to make you friends instead of lose them. After my Jared deck, I took about a two year hiatus from building any new commander decks. I had a lot going on in my life at the time. I had just moved. I was starting a new job. I had just moved in with my partner for the first time. And so I really didn't have a lot of time to think about magic. But once I got settled into my new routines and had a little bit of free time, I found myself going back to magic. And now that I was back, I wanted to build decks that tried things I had never tried before. One gimmick I wanted to try was a secret commander, a card in the 99 that my deck was really built around and my commander is just there as a filler. Another idea I wanted to try was to build a deck with a commander who's intentionally obscure. A commander that's not only underwhelming in appearance, but also very open-ended. So when I played people with it for the first time, they really wouldn't have any idea by looking at the commander what the deck was about. And in addition to all that, I wanted to build a deck that was green and or black because those were the two colors I played the least. And all of that came together in a beautiful way with my Blex Vexing Pest deck. The whole deck is designed to have layers of obscurity where it leads you into thinking I'm going one way when I'm actually going the other way. For example, where I can, I play creatures that are pests, bats, insects, snakes, or spiders just to sort of lead people on to thinking that this might be some kind of tribal deck. But I'm also playing cards that aggressively mill myself. So my opponents might think this is a graveyard strategy deck, which it is sort of, but I'm also packing a bunch of ways to gain life, which again sort of helps the theme of the deck, but also is there to give people the impression that I might be using Blex for his dies trigger. But really what this deck is all about is its secret commander, Lich's Mastery. Yes, Blex's secret is he's actually a master lich, and the whole goal of the deck is to trick people into thinking I'm a life gain deck, so they punch me until I'm nearly dead, and then I play a card like Lich's Mastery, which prevents me from dying for having zero or less life. So once I'm at zero or less life, I can use cards like Repay in Kind to make everybody else's life total equal to mine, but they will die and I won't because I have Lich's Mastery. Or to play a card like Sickening Dreams and do 40 damage to all of the players on the battlefield, but keep myself alive on a technicality that Lich's Mastery is still on the battlefield when they all lose. This deck works surprisingly well. It's all in the mind games. Players who are facing the deck for the first time might think they're winning by bringing my life total down when I'm gaining life, but as soon as I drop Lich's Mastery and then gain 20 more life, I draw 20 new cards. And players who have played against this deck before don't even know what it feels like to be winning. I specifically remember remember a game where the rest of the players at the table agreed to not punch me anymore, despite the fact that I had no creatures out of fear that I would somehow survive the combat damage and then combo off and kill everybody. So they let me heal to an extent and then they would punch me, but then they'd let me heal again out of fear that they'd punch me too much and then I'd punish them and take the game. This deck had the potential to be extremely fun and extremely complicated. Its one fatal flaw is that it can get to a point where I have way too many triggers going at once and it becomes exhausting. My turns take forever. I forget triggers that I needed. I don't think the deck is hopeless. I think I just need to cut some of the cards out that aren't really helping for all of the triggers they're causing me. Old Rutstein, I'm looking at you. The salt score for this deck is 28.66, coming right in under Kazool, proving to me that salt scores do not reflect how salty you should be against that deck. People don't know that they should be afraid of the Blex deck, and I guess that was the whole point. The next deck that I built was my direct Revy Hive Mind Everybody Plays Everybody Else's Deck Deck, also known as the Hive Mind Combo Deck. After I started getting burned out of my Blex deck, I got really obsessed with the creature Derevi Imperial Tactician. The fact that you can pay 4 mana at any time to put Derevi directly onto the battlefield without casting it was incredible to me. And somehow, while I was searching through really expensive blue cards to be the next secret commander of my next deck, I realized the Eternal Dominion Hive Mind Combo. The way it works is if I have the hive mind enchantment out and then I cast a spell with the epic ability like eternal dominion every player must cast a copy of that spell and therefore the epic ability triggers for all of them so nobody can cast any more spells for the rest of the game the reason Derevi is so important is because that four mana ability is not casting so I can replay my commander but nobody else can you might be asking why would you build around eternal dominion and not one of the other epic spells for me that was the whole soul of the deck. Both this deck and my Blex deck represent my return to the philosophy that I'm building decks to puzzle my opponents. I want to put them in situations that require them
them to think and get creative to escape. When I wasn't really into magic, I was playing a game called Hearthstone instead. It's a card game similar to magic, but it takes place in the World of Warcraft universe. And in it, there's a boss fight with a guy named Archthief Rafam. And his gimmick is that right when the match begins, he says to you, I like your deck, I think I will take it. And then he takes your deck from you and gives you his old deck, which is full of like commons and cards that are generally considered to be pretty bad. And in spirit, that's what my deck hopes to achieve. Essentially a complete shuffling around of everybody's deck. And the best part is that my deck has no good targets for Eternal Dominion. I mean, the best they're going to get is a land. Every single creature in the deck has base power and toughness 0-0, zero, zero, and it's supposed to enter with 1-1 one, one counters if you cast it. So if one of my opponents tries to choose a creature from my deck, it'll likely go right into my graveyard from the battlefield as a state-based action for having zero toughness. I have no artifacts in the deck that aren't creatures with zero toughness. The only two enchantments I have are Hive Mind itself and Candle Keep Sage, which at best will draw them one card when their commander dies, and then their commander's not going to be recastable for the rest of the game. Eternal Dominion doesn't allow players to take instants, sorceries, planeswalkers, or battles, so I can run as many of those as I want and not worry about them being stolen at all. The beautiful thing is when they choose to steal from me, they get to see my entire deck, and so they know that I'm speaking with 100% honesty and sincerity when I tell them that my deck has nothing good to steal. It only takes one round of this at the table before all of the players realize that if they keep trying to steal from me, they're missing their one opportunity per turn to steal something good from somebody else. And even if they kill me, the effect doesn't end. In the game's eyes, each of them cast Eternal Dominion themselves, so none of them can cast spells for the rest of the game. Therefore, there's really no motivation to kill me, even out of revenge. I'm likely hardly the strongest player at the table. I'm stealing from the same deck that they're stealing from. Even the instants and sorceries I filled the rest of this deck out with have been hand selected because they work well with Hive Mind on the battlefield. Some of them will do nothing for my opponents even if Hive Mind is out. Others will give me a bonus effect that won't apply to anybody else at the table. And once Hive Mind is out, I only need it for one turn so I can cast my Eternal Dominion. If an opponent tries to counter my Eternal Dominion, we all get copies of counter spells, including myself. And then it becomes a game of whose counter is countering whose copy of Eternal Dominion. There's always still going to be at least two Eternal Dominions that resolve, since I won't be using my counter spell to counter an Eternal Dominion, but I will be using my counter spell to counter somebody else's counter spell. And then it becomes a game of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And who gets the short end of the stick in the game? All in all, I am very proud of this deck. This deck is without a doubt my magnum opus. It's the result of months and months of searching, crafting, and studying the rules of Magic the Gathering, and its reputation at the table precedes it. In one sense, it's much more liberating than a stasis or winter orb lock, because you can still play cards. But on the other hand, it's even more restricting and limiting than a stasis or a winter orb because it cannot be undone. The only downfall of this deck was that people hate playing against it. I thought when making this deck that people would prefer it to something like a Teferi Stasis deck, but really it receives just about as much hate. According to Archidec, this deck has a salt score of 35.36, which is about an average amount of salt. But I can tell you from personal experience, a few games with the same player using this deck tends to induce massive amounts of salt. The next deck on our list is a big step away from the grandiosity of my Derevi deck towards a more modest and narrow goal. I was interested in the PDH or Pauper EDH format and I wanted a deck, but I knew I also wanted my deck to be playable in EDH, so it had to generate value and be strong enough to run with the rest of the EDH decks at the table. And so what I eventually came up with was Wilson Refined Grizzly and Guild Artisan. Full disclosure, I built this deck and the deck was mine, but it's not anymore. My partner has claimed Wilson as her favorite deck and so as a gift I begrudgingly gave him away. But I totally see why it's her favorite. This deck is incredibly consistent. It's difficult to not be able to cast Wilson on turn two and then on turn three you cast Guild Artisan, swing with Wilson and you get your two treasures and it pays for itself. Then the game plan of the deck is Voltron where we're just going to keep loading Wilson up with equipment and then as we're swinging we're going to be making treasures every turn and the rest of our deck is going to be cards that benefit from lots of artifacts entering the battlefield like Reckless Fire Fireweaver, or cards that benefit from artifacts going to the graveyard, like Fangry and Marauder. 
We even have some affinity in here. And thanks to Krark Clan Shaman, our deck actually contains one good board wipe. We even have a win condition in this deck in the form of Scrapyard Salvo. With it, we can shoot somebody in the face with damage equal to the amount of artifacts in our graveyard, which can get up to like 20 to 30. The Wilson deck is unique on this list for having a really fierce, really strong, really consistent early game, but having at best an average late game. It'd be like if you had a car that could go from 0 to 50 in 2 seconds, but 50 is its maximum speed. Still, if you're playing at a casual EDH table, Wilson will fit right in. The Wilson deck comes in strong with a salt score of 18.48 the lowest salt score I've personally ever seen. And that's reflected in the game too. Nobody ever has a problem with the Wilson deck. And the last deck on this list is my Zerta the Dawn Waker Lands Don't Matter deck. I started putting this deck together all the way back when I was making my Blex deck, with the original vision for the deck being that Mono White and Mono Red already have enough support to ramp lands that you don't really need green at all for a Lands Matter deck. So I wanted to see what I could do and if I could do it without green. Of course, once my Blex deck started picking up, the Zerta deck was put to the side, and then after that, my Derevi deck took most of my attention. And so the Zerta deck sat incomplete until I finally put it together a little less than a year ago. This deck is the sole recipient of the upgrades I've been willing to dish out to my decks. For the commander, I decided to go with Zerta because a second theme started to pop up in my head. If you remember all the way back to the first commander deck on this list, I mentioned that there were utility lands in the deck that sort of just were there because I love utility lands. And as I was building this deck, it became more and more clear to me that I would benefit the most from my white ramp if I had less lands than my opponents. So I decided to curve the theme of this deck from landfall and ramping to land self-destruction, where I'm using my lands and sacrificing my lands to get value as soon as possible. And Zerta's ability reduces the activation cost for those lands. One extremely notable example is the card Dark Depth. If I play Dark Depths as my land for turn while Zerda's on the battlefield, I only need to pay one colorless mana to remove an ice counter from the land. Meaning if I can pay the 10 colorless mana as soon as it comes out, I can get my 2020 Merit Lodge right away. And because so many of these lands that sacrifice themselves generate tokens, I decided to make tokens a sub-theme in this deck. Oh, there's so much I can talk about with this deck. Like how I can sacrifice Drownyard Temple to aggressive mining and then pay one mana to return it to the battlefield tapped. So next turn I can do the same thing again, allowing me to basically pay one mana to draw two cards on everybody's turn. Or how I can sacrifice all of my lands to Zurin Orb or Aura Fracture and then use cards like Faith's Reward to return them all to the battlefield untapped so I can use them again. Or when sometimes I cast From the Ashes I actually gain more mana than I lost because I have so many non-basic lands that get sacrificed and replaced with untapped basic lands while all of my opponents have to sack all of their non-basic lands and sometimes find nothing or even how the revolt ability triggers when you sacrifice a land or a treasure token so you can farm that every single turn. Once you see the synergy and how everything fits together, this deck is so much fun to play. And it's not bad either. This deck's salt score comes in at only 21.83, which is pleasantly surprising to me. For a deck that personally lets me have so much fun and have so many cool interactions, it's really nice to know that players generally aren't really bothered by what I'm doing. And this applies in my playgroup as well. When I show up for magic, Magic Knights, people ask me to bring my Zerta deck out, not because it's a group hug deck or benefits them in any way in particular. They're just curious what kind of weird, janky land stuff I'm going to be doing with it. And they know even if I win, it's probably not going to ruin their night. I will say when I started this deck, I had a little bit of land destruction in it, and players did not love that. But now that most of that is cut out, yeah, I can see Zerta being a pretty fun deck to play against, especially when the alternative is being hive-minded by the Derevi deck. Now it's time to get to the rankings. First up, we're looking at salt score. There's nothing too surprising here that I didn't mention already before, but looking at this now I am noticing a trend where my most recent decks have averaged lower salt scores. I mean look at Teferi and Hisoka. Two of my oldest decks have the highest salt score, and Wilson and Zerda are my two most recent decks. The two notable exceptions are my Jared Budget 25 cent deck and my Derevi Hive Mind combo deck. Here's my best estimates on the power level of each deck. It's interesting when looking at this that it seems to be a pattern that the extreme 
extremes either way of salt score are the decks that are the least powerful and the decks that are consistently pretty strong are tending towards the middle of the list one deck to note is my hisoka minamu sensei deck i gave this deck a power level of five because as i mentioned earlier this deck it probably isn't even that good at a casual table sure you have some pretty overpowered mana rocks in that deck and every once in a while you can cobble together an infinite mana combo and win the game that way but that's all up to luck and random chance and when you're rocking a salt score that high you already know people are going to hate you as soon as you hit the table so you're likely going to be targeted pretty early on lastly i gave each deck a score based on how complex it is to play i feel like my jared and my kazool decks are pretty intuitive and easy to learn when there's somebody who hasn't played magic before that's interested in learning the format i usually give them one of those two decks and play the other one and they usually seem to pick it up after a couple games whereas my Doretti and my niambi decks i consider to be standard complexity you can pick it up and run with it but your first couple games are going to be clunky and slow and some of the combos and synergies might not be readily apparent and you might not know what to tutor for when you pull a tutor from your deck but i think that sort of will work itself out and you won't really need to study the deck you can just get the feel for it as time goes on for my blex hisoka and derevi decks i consider them to be very complex you cannot be a new player and pick up these decks and just figure them out you need a strong understanding of the rules of this game and you probably need to dedicate some time to like study the deck almost play a couple games by yourself see how things are interacting with each other there are some very specific pieces in this deck that need to be played in a very specific order to get what you want and if i tried to play this deck five years ago ten years ago i would have been frustrated and quit probably and that's my full list thank you for watching all the way to the end i know this was a long video and as i mentioned at the beginning if you're interested in seeing the decks that i have in purely digital formats stay tuned because i'll be making videos about those in the future and thank you again for watching